here at Depth of Field really want to broaden the scope of what we show, who we showcase, and the energy of our actual show. Uh, in general, we want you to step away from Depth of Field with really a 360 degree view. That being said, for many years, I was Facebook friends with a photographer, Jessica Hines. And actually, for those of you that really pursue speakers and uh, instigators within photography, uh, you'll notice that certain people uh, you'll be friends with. And if you click on the C uh, Mutual Friends, you'll see some of the same names in there. Uh, A.D. Coleman, uh, just a, a number of photographers uh, that are in a sort of a Facebook circle. One of them is Jessica Hines. I've been admiring her work and discussions for uh, many times uh, over the years, but never actually knew her. But all of a sudden, I discovered this project that she had recently completed and a book called My Brother's War. And I reached out to her and said, this actually fits into depth of field in an amazing way because it is a deeply personal project uh, that is very informative and is at the uh, really at ground zero uh, for a photographer's development. Uh, because not only does it deal with important subject matter on a personal level, it also shows the scope of being out there and telling our stories and getting the attention of the Washington Post and other uh, very large media outlets uh, on this book project that Jessica Hines uh, just recently finished. Uh, Jessica Hines is a uh, photographer, and she's also a teacher at Georgia Southern University, where she teaches photography and art inspiration. I'm sorry, art appreciation. Uh, so I'd like everybody to welcome Jessica Hines to Depth of Field. And Jess, on behalf of everyone here, welcome to Depth of Field. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for asking me. And um, um Ready to go. Okay. Well, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Um, you have many projects and, and much work. If you could share some of your motivation for that. Sure, sure. Well, I think um, off the top of my head, I think I was probably born an artist. I think um, I think that happens. I think you can become one, whether you were or not. But I think I started off that way. Uh, my father was an artist. Um and so I kind of grew up with with that environment. And he took lots and lots of photographs, which you'll see some of in, in a minute, um, that inspired me, I think, to become a photographer, too, because the magic of those pictures was uh, um, oh, overwhelming to me. So it was like a little magic box, you know, that I um, couldn't wait to see what the pictures looked like. And so, you know, I eventually you know, went to school and studied art and photography and um, um, can't stop making it. I, I keeps me alive, <laughs> keeps me going. I can't, I am so happy when I'm making photographs, frankly, even if they are, if, if they're not good, um, just the process of, of making them. Sometimes I enjoy that so much that um, uh, it's good to just do it. <laughs> so I, I think there's a lot of providence in having you come speak because uh, we talked about this uh, a couple of months ago, uh, but uh, according to current events right now, uh, the world is at war again, yeah. and uh, I think that makes a, a very poignant uh, touch back to to your work, um, especially the the book, my brother's work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, it was the history of the of the project and how that worked out? Sure, it's it's kind of strange how how it all came to be, but I had a friend who was a political scientist and. You know, just over dinners, over time, um, he became aware of the fact that my brother had been in Vietnam and he was teaching a class on the uh, politics of, of the war in Vietnam. And so he asked me one day if he could borrow some of my letters. I thought, ooh, you know, I haven't read those in a long time. And frankly, the whole my story is one of uh, trying to forget my past a lot. You know, it's a lot of trauma in it. And I I literally put the box that I inherited and moved from one place to another in the back of a closet, you know. And so I had to read the letters. And um, that's really what got it started. Um, he wanted to allow his students actually to read the letters so that they could feel more connected to a real soldier. And um, um, it kind of went from there. His encouragement kind of got me started. And once I, I started reading the letters too, it was, um, 
it was a good thing, you know, I was afraid of it, but I could hear my brother's voice again. And it was like he was alive and I was that little child again and I could hear my parents and that whole world came to life again. There were some good things, you know, there. So, um, yeah, that's how it began. You know, for our viewers, uh, My Brother's War is about Jess's uh, brother uh, who uh, served in, in Vietnam and, uh, and did survive the war initially and then later on did commit suicide. Right. And uh, so I found in the Washington Post article, it was very poignant uh, where you pointed out that uh, the numbers uh, shown for the casualties in Vietnam don't reflect the post-traumatic stress that follows uh, also the Agent Orange and the and the, the nasty chemicals uh, that were that were used and our, our everybody that was there was subject to. Uh, right. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more? Um, you went through the letters, which I, I would assume is, you're saying is a very cathartic experience. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit uh, the next steps and how you you put this project together? Well, every night I'd come home and read some of the letters and, and it was this marvelous trip to the past and that voice of my brother came back and I was happy. I was actually happy through a lot of it, although, you know, sometimes mortified, you know, when I when I read certain things in the letters. But um, suddenly I finished the letters. I realized there are no more. The voice stops. It's, here it is again. And then, oh, you know, it was another really bad feeling. So it was the middle of the night. I remember um, getting getting up from the chair and <clears throat> going over to the box that I had of his belongings and <clears throat> starting to really search through there to try to find other things, something else. And I discovered that night that he um, he had fallen in love with with someone uh, who planned that they planned to get married. And there were these little love notes. Here I am by myself you know, in the middle of the night, finding the, these notes, like, I love you, I love you. Oh my gosh, I never knew any of this, you know? So it was, I was, just, it was just a lot of revelations and things that were just happening out of the blue, you know, unexpected. The story's not about Vietnam, you know, Vietnam just happens to be the background. It's the backdrop of where the story took place. It's just a chance of time and place. And so my story has to be this because that's what happened. That's what happened in my life. So. Um, you know, this story could could play out anywhere uh, in any time because it's it's universal. It's a war story and it doesn't matter which war it is. And so he was my big brother. You can see how small I'm standing on a step and I'm still a fraction. You know, that my family, I was the surprise child, you know, um, but um, big brother and little sister is sort of how we referred to each other, you know, for a long time. Um, and by the way, this picture was made in Mexico, of all things. I took a workshop with Maggie Steber for uh, Day of the Dead, Oaxaca. And uh, one morning I was out walking, wonder where ideas come from. Out of the nowhere came this idea of, of uh, going to the, we were going to the cemetery and I thought, oh, there'll be flowers there. And I'd been doing some things with flowers anyway. And um, I took letters uh, then and I brought snapshots and photographs where I continued to make pictures um, to help me finish the stories where I got the idea to how I finished it. But um, this is the only picture I have of us when we were older. And I went to Colorado to visit him where he was living. And uh, it was his idea that I come visit. And my uh, high school buddy, best friend uh, came to and she took the, the snapshot of us. And it remains the only photo I have of us when, when we were a bit more grown. Um, and so this is the book cover. You can see here, it's a, a bit lighter. This was sort of my design in the beginning. I was the designated family photographer as my father became too old and sick, I think, to continue taking all the pictures. He took the one on the left of Gary. And I made the one on the right, same spot, same backyard, many years apart. Here he is after the war, you know, and he told me, he called up one time and he said, you know, you're not going to remember me because I look really, you're not going to remember. He said, um, 
uh, you you won't recognize me because I just really look different. And he described that he had long hair and, um, but um, I often start with this picture because the disabled American veteran, um, this was the notification letter that said that he had something called a service connected nervous condition. And uh, there was the post-traumatic stress or what we now say PTSD, which to me is just a meaningless acronym. I refuse to use it, but that's what they called it at the time. And so, uh, but you know, disabled American veteran, it could be any veteran anywhere in the world throughout time, past, present, future, um, same thing. Serendipitous things happened when I was photographing and I did not know this consciously, but as I was setting this up with mirrors and light and um, out in a sand pile in the yard, um, a skull formed. And I didn't, I didn't even know it until I looked at the negatives and I thought, whoa, look at that. Strange goings on. And he wrote, every day is just like the next. They come and go. How long was he in country for? Two years. Another thing that happened too is that I uh, was open just to these serendipitous happenings. You might think a still life that wouldn't happen, but it does. And I would go outside too where other things could, could happen. And the wind blew this letter. And it, at one point it became like a tent. I have another version of it where it's, it looks like a tent. And I thought, oh, look at that. That's, that's even better. And so here you see him in Vietnam as a soldier and the letters, which there are 40 pages of letters that are in the book. And I went to Vietnam, um, not once, but twice. Um, once just wasn't enough. And I went the following year and little did I know here what was really brewing was this was an enormous storm, a thunderstorm. It looked so innocent to me. I, at least I didn't think it was you know anything to worry about. But this was Chu Lai. Uh, as it looked when I arrived, very desolate, very empty. And so was the airport. I asked my driver to take me to um, the Chulai airport and they were, I think maybe they were refurbishing it because I, as I understand it, it's a, it's a functioning airport now, but at the time it wasn't. And, and for years you couldn't even find it on the map. There wasn't anything there, but it was completely empty. And I think all of this just really mirrored my psychological state of this just sort of void emptiness. Mm -hmm. And I was alone um, for the most part. Actually on this trip, I did have a friend who came with me. I was very happy that he was willing to just accompany me that day. Um, on my first trip to Chulai. Um, but this car, the only car there, that's my driver. At one point, the driver drove away. <laughs> it, was, it was the the next year, I think. And I was completely alone. <laughs> I thought, now my driver just left. And it was, it was a good two and a half hour drive, I think, from where I was staying. And I thought, well, now what am I going to do? I might be being abandoned here. But he was finding shade. <laughs> but, uh, but here you see the storm um, forming. Again, the emptiness, it's just sort of, again, that void, all of that, including the storm, seemed to just be an embodiment of my own feelings. Mm. So there are, as I said, many pages of letters, which I, I don't have in the PDF here, but um, you can see, I took them back to the place where they were written. For some reason, I felt like I want, just wanted to do that. And then when we made the book, I, I scanned them so they could be read. And then I have a chapter called The Imaginings where I wondered what happened. And, and I did find out because now we have the internet, we can look up things that we couldn't do when, you know, when I was a child or, or a teenager or anything. But um, I had these photographs for years and I wondered what, what are these of? I couldn't ask anybody and I found a timeline on his army company's website. And I could, I found out what all of these were. And I also went to two of Gary's reunions. One was in Ocean City, Maryland, and another one in Savannah, actually. 
and he took supplies out to the front line. So I don't know what he saw. He may have witnessed some things that I'll never know. But these are his photographs. Oh, and um, I, I put my thumb in a lot of these and, and I consider that a bit of a self-portrait, <clears throat> including the front uh, of the book uh, with the shadow, <clears throat> excuse me, of my hand. I love that you incorporated your thumb and hand into the into the photo. It's a reminder of the storyteller and that there's somebody taking these pictures. You know how photographs of all the, the forms of art that we have, <clears throat> they seem seamless sometimes as if they just made themselves, as if they just happen to exist that way, right? And, and they're not. <laughs> uh, that's what makes them so dangerous, really, I think, is that they, they are constructed and, and made. Uh, then I, in the box, I discovered where Gary um, was buried, but I also discovered where he, where he died. And I um, went to that house. I rented a car and flew there by myself and rented this car and drove there um, and just wanted to see it. You can see March 8th right there. I didn't know where my mother was buried either, if, if that is any indication of, of all the traumas. But uh, I found out that my mother and my brother are buried together. <clears throat> it's in a military cemetery. And so her name is on one side of the stone and his is on the other. And I had to sit there for a while. I stayed until it was time to go, until it closed. But I, 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 the challenge was how do you make a photograph that's not just a cliche picture of a gravestone, right? So he died by gunshot. And so he was a very good shot. He, this is his target practice. And this, these were little holes as seen through um, a passport to Vietnam that he had. And I like just the, the shapes and the way they related to his dog tag. And there's the girlfriend surprise. Hmm. These were a more upbeat note. I think I like the uh, the goldfish symbol of um, prosperity and, and good fortune. And it's combined with Gary's letter and my father's childhood drawing. And I'd never been to the Vietnam Memorial Wall before. And um, I write in the book about the fact that there are so many more people who died from that war that their names aren't there. And so when I was there, I, I, I taped a note and, and I put my brother's name on there. So it was, it was at least his name was there for the day. So here they are arriving in Vietnam and here they are now going to visit the wall. It's a powerful monument. Once I had a conversation with Gary about the letters that he sent, and he said that he, he had been reading them, and he felt really awful about the fact that he had talked about bombing sometimes, you know. And, and the problem then was that there was no, there were no phone calls ever. You couldn't do that. And the only way you could communicate was through letters. And it took about two weeks for a letter to even get to you. So you really didn't even know what happened. He says, oh, I've got to go because I hear mortars landing on the beach. Oh, my gosh, my poor parents, you know, and, and uh, worrying about what would happen. And so um, you can see that he's addressing that issue here on, on a card. And just a quick peek at interesting stationery that that the government provided back then vietnam he signed his name in vietnamese there he was learning to speak the language and and of course he had a, someone he wanted to marry and um i think that was a big part of it plus i think he was just interested in other people and cultures and language and 
He ordered a flag, an American flag. He wanted my mom to find some American flags. He gave the specific size and everything. And he said he wanted one for himself and he wanted one to give to his friend. And then I have a Vietnamese flag that she must have given him. And so I did go to these reunions. I was so lucky because usually for me, I would find, oh, that reunion took place three years ago and you missed it. But this time it was in the future and, and I had time to buy a, a ticket and I could go. So I, I did, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, people talked to me and described pictures. I brought photographs with me. So they told me about what some of the things were that had been a big mystery to me. And you know, another interesting thing that happened was that uh, when you start enlarging, scanning and, and enlarging these photographs, these snapshots that you've seen all of your life is small. Suddenly um, you see things in the rooms and, and, and it becomes like another uh, universe <laughs> to explore. So that was interesting. But I tell a story in the book about visiting a Vietnam veteran and what happened. Now, this is kind of a surprise. And I have a picture here of Gary's friends and he wrote the names down. And I went to every extreme possible to try to locate these people. Uh, I called, I even called, I got a wrong number one time and the person said, well, that's so interesting that I'll try to help you find that person, you know? And, and I actually did find some of his friends. And in and, and another case, one of them had died like three months prior to my calling after like, you know, 35 years or something. Well, I went to a reunion and this man came up and introduced himself and I was so blown away and he brought his photo album too. And I had mine and it turns out we had different versions of the same scene. And he took a lot of the photographs that I have had all my life or nearly all my life, you know, since I was eight years old. So uh, amazing that suddenly this man, <laughs> I would see him, uh, Oh, by the way, that that picture is not in the book. This is just something I in, in, interspersed here just to show. And uh, this was about post-traumatic stress. I thought that posture and, and the explosion sort of re of refusal to acknowledge your environment and your own mind. It's like something he's imagining behind him. But this, the, it's a deadpan face, right? Uh, a lot of people who have this invisible affliction are... Um, reluctant to talk about their experiences. They don't want to talk about it and they shut down and it's invisible. It's in a, a, and it's, it's one of those things like um, depression, I think, and anxiety, you know, things that are called mental illnesses. You know, it, there really aren't any mental illnesses. They're illnesses because the body and mind are one and uh, we can blame Descartes for, for that separation. But, you know, it's one of, one of those diseases where you can get blamed for it, <laughs> you know, shame on you. Uh, but people who suffer from this affliction, they actually have a brain um, um, damage. So I pray for your spirit. The title comes from a, a little... Um, writing from his girlfriend. And I, I, I went anywhere to try to get these things translated. You know, I just, I would see a store or something and go in. I, I, can you, can you tell me what this says? So they, they told me that it loosely translated. What I found was I, I pray for your spirit. And I wonder what the girlfriend knew, what had he revealed to her? What did she know that I I'm, will never know? I'm sure um, very unlikely, but I think um, Gary was interested in his new role as a soldier. And so um, he went into the old photo booths that, you know, we all had and you put a quarter in, you get four pictures. And so he was exploring his new identity. And so this is an early picture. And I made it, um, that's a, a shrine um, in Vietnam in the background, a uh, home of a, a rice farmer I visited. And there's symbols here that people wouldn't know about. For example, I, I purchased this bowl in Vietnam, in Hoi An. It was something that had been submerged in the sea. And so was this, this little vessel. I wanted to make a picture about trauma. And I thought, how can I do that? How can I make a, a photo about trauma when, when there's nothing visual happening in front of me? So I'm gonna have to create something. <clears throat> so I thought, a water tornado. I'll make a water tornado. And I and I had gone to so many extremes. Uh, I wanted to know so much. 
And there was nothing. So I went on eBay, for example, and I would look up, I typed in Chu Lai and believe it or not, up come maps. And someone had made a DVD of their time in, in Chu Lai around the same time that my brother was there. So I could see pictures. But um, there's a map that's an actual map of wartime back here in Vietnam and a letter that he wrote on a day that he was very upset. He wrote, um, it's Mother's Dad. It was Mother's Day. And there, this was about a, 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 um, a battle. But I stirred that. I, I must have, I don't know how many photos I had to take to get that to work out just right. But here's one of those serendipitous things where the wind blew. I must have taken, I don't know, 100 photos of this or more. And suddenly the wind blew in the shape of a, of a plant blue that echoed the shape of that spoon. And that ended up being the right one. I did not plan the halo. Another coincidence, serendipitous event. I used mirrors. I know where it came from. I had mirrors. Uh, sometimes I reflect light up into, into um, scenes. And I, as the sun moved across the sky as I was out photographing, finally it hit it and bounced over right to where I was, but to scale. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, it's a halo. So I was just, you know, so excited uh, that that happened. But again, you know, it's it's just being ready to accept the unexpected, I suppose. And these are um, where I, I managed to get information. I, I started to say this, but I, um, I utilized something called find a neighbor online. I believed I had the name and address of one of Gary's friends and I was just sure of it. His name was unusual enough. You know, it was the unusual names that I could find those people. And so um, he wouldn't answer the phone. It just rang and rang and rang. And I, you know, a couple of months would go by and I'd try it again. It's like, huh, it's not picking up. What else can I do? I've got his address. So I looked it up and uh, this find a neighbor. So I called someone on his street, <laughs> just said, I think your neighbor is someone who was a friend of, of the family. And I'm wondering if you could deliver this message. And they did. And I reached him and I found out all kinds of interesting things that, um, and this is what the box looked like. That's pretty much everything I had. And these were his army issued glasses. No, notice they were cracked, beginning to crack. Um, but over some years, because I said like years passed, I was I had them in a clear container and in my studio. And one day I was just walking by. This was just recently, it was like right before I went to, to France. And I thought, look at the glasses, they're disintegrating. Oh, I'll have to make another photograph. And so I set it up in the, on the same map and in pretty much the same location and lit it the same way. But they're, they're just disintegrating. And, it, and it, you know, it speaks of time, the nature of time. And there's the mysterious girlfriend. Um, I have these pictures of families. Um, in fact, I, I collect photographs uh, from the past, especially if I find a, a little group that, you know, I respond to um, and they become sort of my surrogate family. Uh, so uh, I lived in foster homes a lot when I was growing up. And so, I don't know, photographs became important. I, I took pictures of my family, you know, with me. And so now I've, I've sort of adopted these other people and I wonder about their lives and, you know, could any of them, I, you know, almost assuredly not, but I imagine them as maybe one of them could have been Gary's girlfriend. And this is the letter he wrote the night before he went to Vietnam. That's the envelope. And here I arrived 40 years later and notice the, the, uh, the date, November 3rd. He arrived on my birthday, November 4th. And here he is wearing a Vietnamese outfit because his girlfriend, I think, must have given him that. He just liked people. I'm sure he didn't want to go and kill anybody, you know, or have anything to do with it. So um, I still have this. I have this outfit. And that's the letter written. Um, Tomorrow morning I leave for Vietnam. And I arrived. 
40 years later. I began to play with uh, interspersing the letters um, in the work. This is long before the book was, was, you know, in the works at all, really. And I didn't know that I would actually be able to print you know, his letters. So I, uh, I incorporated photographs I took there and um, the letter, this was a sad one, one, one near, near to the end of his life when things were not going well and he was suffering from depression. And I blurred out parts of the letter just as, um, as a foggy mind might perceive the world. And somehow this one called for inversion uh, to darkness. But the letter could still be read. Oh, um, I found out what that was. All my life I had that photograph and it was um, a booby trap, part of a booby trap. So I don't know how he came to have that, but that's what his comrades at the reunion told me. And then the cherry blossoms were uh, important to me. I planted that tree. I'm looking at it right now out of my window. I planted this cherry tree, a Yoshino cherry tree. And that's a symbol. Um, it was a symbol in Japan um, um, of the kamikaze, really, who, who gave up on the idea that you know, it was the, the base. Well, they just thought that basically everything is just, it's sort of futile. They're going to die. And um, the, the cherry blossom became kind of a symbol of that because it, it blooms in this just wonderful glory. The, the uh, flowers are extraordinary, beautiful. And, uh, and then all at once, they all just start to fall and drop. And what I was trying to do though, in this chat last chapter was to um, consider memory and the fact that, um, um, you know, the photographs are, are memory triggers, but um, I wanted to have a healing aspect to this. You know, and every war has lived twice, uh, once on the battlefield and once in memory, right? And um, Viet Nguyen wrote that, uh, that's a quote from him that I actually have in the book, um, wonderful writer, but it's true. And, and so I was trying to make healing pictures here. And you can see that I've incorporated these spring, Georgia, azaleas and flowers and cherry blossoms. That's inside of a Chinook. I started the flowers many years prior to going to Mexico. This was also cherry blossoms. So the idea was already seeded in my mind years prior to, to that trip. And I liked the editing process here. It was fun to do this where, you know, you start to match up subject matter that works together along with color palette. And there he is with the fallen cherry blossoms. And this last picture, when I made this, I knew I had the last picture in the book. And the funny thing is, is, is there is a story with this one. And I, I tried to reach his best friend for nine years, really. I never give up. That's the thing. Don't give up, folks. Don't give up. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. Because sometimes, eventually, something's going to happen. Um, and I, I Googled up a different word one night and I thought I have found him and I am going to call in the morning. I have no idea what I'm going to say to this man, but I'm calling him in the morning. And I did. And he was pretty well floored. And he told me about a, um, vision that he had about 10 years. He said, after Gary died, he was going to bed and he said, he, went into his room and suddenly he had this vision of his roof, the ceiling opening up and that he could see the stars. And suddenly there was this beam of light and my brother appeared to him in this, in this light. And he was very serious. He said, it was not a friendly visit. It wasn't a happy visit. It was a serious visit. <clears throat> he said that my brother told him that he needed to change his ways or, or his life was not going to turn out well. And he wanted him to, um, to, 
start to live a better life. And so this man told me that he listened and he did. And, um, and he said that, and then Gary just started to recede and the light dimmed and the ceiling closed back up. And I, I just never thought I would get that story when I called somebody, you know, what a story. So I thought, well, I have to make a photograph of this. And, you know, my nature is to, is to photograph so many times. I'll, I'll take, you know, a lot of images to get to the one. There's so many failures. I'm not showing you all the failures, you know, the pictures I have. All photographers have a lot of failures. But you know what? This is one of two pictures I can think of in my entire life that the very first one I took was it. This was it. I snapped that. And you know what? I went to Google Earth at this point because I couldn't go back to Vietnam again a third time. So I went to Google Earth at night. You can do that. Um, and I went to Chu Lai. So that's the, the sky at Chu Lai. And, um, and I put this little photo of him and I used this reflective material and, and I made it. And that was that first shot. That was it. All the others were not as good for what whatever reason. But I knew that would be the final picture in the book. And then I had to go back and, you know, make the others that I knew needed to fit to tell the story. Um, so there he is sort of receding a little bit back a little further uh, back into the universe. Maybe that's where we were before we were born. And maybe that's where we go when we leave this uh, form that we're all in. But, um, but that's what that's about. So I thought it was the good ending. And then um, I do want to thank uh, my benefactors uh, because this book was published with the generous support of the Gilman and Gonzalez Faya Arts Foundation. Uh, Sandra Gilman, who passed away in May of last year, and her husband, her dear husband, Celso um, Gonzalez Faya, uh, funded my book, and I am forever grateful. So that they helped make this a reality. So uh, I want to share uh, the link uh, to look at the book and uh, hopefully purchase uh, the book. Uh, please yes. share that. And uh, you know, really, uh, just uh, thank you so much for for coming and sharing your stories and your photography and. Uh, your very unique way of, of looking at photography with the depth of field audience. It's mm -hmm. really been a, a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated and very honored. And so nice to meet you face to face here. Well, sort of face to face. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Different than Facebook. <laughs> from, from New York City to, to Georgia. Yes, indeed. It's been, it's been great. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you so much again. And uh, we look forward to seeing what's next.